on Rescue 911. An offshore killer. A real-life Jaws. She was carrying a live piece of bait. Nearly rips the life from a swimmer. I just couldn't believe a shark would do so much damage to one person. On a remote island with the nearest doctor miles away. Plus, when a father is choking, his son with Down syndrome rushes to help. I spoke three times. One, two, three. On Rescue 911. In 1992, there were only five people on remote Campbell Island, more than 400 miles south of New Zealand, living together at the weather station. They all shared a deep love of nature. But on the afternoon of April 24, 1992, they were reminded that for all its splendor and glory, nature also has a dark side. Campbell Island's a really wild place with no contact with the outside world apart from our radio telephone. We didn't expect to see another ship or even a plane for the, for the whole time we were down there, whole 12 months. On that day, communications specialist Robin Humphrey and the others had decided to stop work early. <laughs> we were going to go across to the western side of the island, which is about an hour and a half's walk, to go for a swim with the sea lions. So we were all really keen to get out there and do it. You know, it's going to be something exciting to do for the afternoon. Linda Dannon was a first aid specialist in the group. Mike and I were planning to dive in this particular bay through the winter with the um, southern right whales. Mike Fraser was the team leader. We spent a lot of time together diving and he was the best dive buddy I've ever had. It's the first time in a long time the whole five of us had done an activity together. You know, we'd been together for, for five and a half months and we'd really clicked. We're on a mission. We're on a mission to have some fun. Last one ends in Australia. <laughs> Jacinda Amy was a Department of Conservation Ranger. We tried to see who could get down to the bottom and, and you're extremely buoyant so it was quite a struggle to dive down onto the bottom. We, we were just, we were just larking around. It was, it was great. Okay. I take it. Yeah. Linda and Rob and Gus and I were all feeling much close together and Mike could flip it out a bit further. Mike yelling and could see him thrashing around at something in the water. It was just, it was really awful. His body was outlined by the, um, by the pointed nose of a shark. And I thought Michael was dead or about to die and there wasn't anything we could do. I mean, you don't attempt to drag him away from a shark. I knew I should have gone for the shore. But I felt his, his pain and his terror, it was, it was just, it was really awful. It was unbelievable um, to, to see that happen in front of you. When we continue. She was carrying a live piece of bait, and that shark was still out there, and Jacinda had no idea where the shark was. Jacinda got a hold of him. She was carrying a live piece of bait, and that shark was still out there. And Jacinda had no idea where the shark was. Nearly there. We directed her just around from the headland a little bit to where there was a shallow, sort of rocky shelf. Get 
Give me a hand, Lucinda. Give me a hand. His injury was very obvious to us at that stage. His right arm was missing from just below the elbow. Roll it down. He was having trouble breathing, and I thought, oh, no, he's, he's not going to make it. The remoteness of our location really, really sunk into me for the first time, and how ill-equipped we were to cope with a situation like that. He's a breathing One of the first things I did was to grab a strap off one of her masks and we wrapped that around his damaged arm just to try and contain the, the blood loss. Keep that press down. Keep that press down. You're talking about a 36-hour boat trip just to get him off the island. Um, you can't fly a, a small aeroplane into there. There's nowhere for him to, for him to land. And I thought, this guy is not going to make it. I'm pretty certain he's going to die here. Push down. Push down. While Linda headed to a nearby hut for first aid supplies, the fastest member of the group, mechanic Gus McAllister, was chosen to run back to the base camp to radio for help. So I took a few instructions from Rob on how to get the radio transmission through, and um, I headed back over the big hill over to the base. You're okay, mate. Okay, Mike, got you now. With you. I got the water. Uh, I just tried to keep him from seeing his, his right arm. But he said to me, oh, no, it, it's all right. I've seen it. I know it's gone. And, and he'd really accepted it already at that stage. Hang in there, Mike. Uh, right, hang in there, Mike. First aid. When I got back, the first thing I wanted to do was remove the tourniquet uh, and put proper pressure bandages on Mike's arm. If it's left on too long, you then start losing the rest of the good part of the arm. Well, find something to spin that arm up with. I'll use that snorkel. He was cold. He was in a severe state of shock. He'd suffered enormous blood loss. Uh, he, he'd lost an arm. His other arm was severely lacerated, and we had to, had to get him to shelter. And our first thought was that, oh, we could, we'll get him up to the hut. He had raw nerves, even though we'd bandaged it up. Just all the blood would just drain out of his face. Uh, you could just see the pain that he underwent when we were trying to move him. And we'd only got about a third of the way, and we couldn't go any further, so we decided we'll bring the hut to Mike. We're 460 miles away from New Zealand in a sub-Antarctic environment. Air temperatures at night are maybe 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit, very cold. That's why we set about getting all this equipment to get them warm. Gus managed to run the five miles back to base camp within 45 minutes. According to their emergency plan, Anyone injured on Campbell Island was to be evacuated by helicopter more than 450 miles to the nearest hospital. But it had never been done before. As time passed, Mike's condition continued to deteriorate. We were sitting in the tent trying to give Mike a lot of confidence, but even so, we knew that to get this helicopter off the ground and get it underway was going to take an awful long time. And uh, we just weren't certain if, if Michael had the strength remaining to, to last out that length of time. Pilot John Fennell had already been working 12 hours when he got the call. The flight that we were about to undertake is probably the longest flight that anyone in this part of the world has ever done in a helicopter. And we had to increase the range of the helicopter from three and a half hours up to at least six and a half, and, and hopefully we would have enough fuel to then turn around and go somewhere else should we not be able to find the island. Gus brought back painkillers and antibiotics a doctor had prescribed over the radio, but there was no stockpile of blood on the island. Despite the risks, paramedic Pat Wynn had volunteered to be the medic on the flight. I was worried about major blood loss, but also whether the patient would be still alive when we arrived. Must have been there about an hour and a half, and the fuel in the main tanks had uh, dropped. Uh, so she had to refuel, machine in mid-air. The longer the, the wait for, for proper medical attention, the greater the risks were of Mike dying. Good on you, Mike. That made the, the wait very long. Can I do anything? Okay. When the rescue helicopter finally got within range of Campbell Island, they made contact with a research ship that had come to the island to try to help. But there was heavy cloud cover in the area. It was a relief to see the, the lights on the boat. 
Yeah. We're actually really, really elated that we made it. We actually finally did it. We were there. He was deeply blue, cyanotic, which is a lack of oxygen. And uh, I asked the ladies concerned, it was blood pressure, the last blood pressure, and they said they couldn't get it for the last hour, which means your kidneys are really starting to fail, and Michael was in a very serious state. Because it was so cold, Pat made the decision we should load him in the helicopter and take him across to the base on the other side of the island. John said to me as I got into the first aid room, he says, um, how long are you going to need? I said, well, John, either way, either the patient dies or we survive. So I'm going to need three hours to try and get this patient back to some condition before we can move out. Right there, Michael, just get into your arm. Hang on there, that's a boy. He undid the, the splint where the snorkel was and Mike's arm basically fell apart. So that meant that Mike had no right arm from his elbow down and he'd lost his left arm. That was worse than seeing his arm taken off. He's in safe hands now. It's real sad. We'd been a real team. You know, and the team's broken. Um, you, know, uh, you know, there are five um, real close people. And now it was time for that one team member to go. Thirty-two-year-old Mike Fraser was taken to the nearest hospital, where miraculously doctors were able to repair his damaged left arm. In the two years since the incident, he has adjusted to the loss of his right arm, and with physical therapy, he continues to slowly regain the use of his left. When I first saw the shark, I thought I was dreaming. Everything happened so quick, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, a shark, it can't be a shark, I mean, there's no sharks here. Then a second thought came across my mind that, oh, I know what it's like to drown now. It wasn't actually crossing my mind that here's the shark that's going to kill me. I thought it was going to drown. It's good to see him up and, and, and about, you know. He, he's not the sort of guy you can keep down. He's, he, he's, he's pretty tough. He's just gone on and lived, and I, I really um, admire him, him for doing that. Uh, yeah, he's done it well. Sid. The thing that, that saved Michael's life was actually the team on the island. If they hadn't uh, given the first aid they did as a team, Michael would have passed away. He would have died before I got to him. People shouldn't be afraid of sharks at all. The odds on getting bitten by a shark are so phenomenally small, it's just not funny. So many more people get killed in car accidents, and yet nobody thinks twice about jumping in the car and driving to work in the morning. Pruning season been cutting off the tree. There's so many people involved. I'm just so, so extremely grateful to everyone. It was a case of good luck, good planning, um, and just everything came off. But you know, I'm, I'm just extremely grateful to everyone involved. Angie, come here. You can come up. Mike and I seem to have become an item. We started to see each other um, quite a lot um, through last year, and um, yeah, fell in love with each other, and sort of thought um, this is the way to go. Now we are together. Mm. Looking forward to a long life together. Next. I took note of the table first, and something just rang in not right. Mom! Dad's choking! Mom! As parents, we tend to think we know the individual limitations and strengths of each of our children. But one summer afternoon in 1993, at their home in Pensacola, Florida, Jerry and Twyla Ard were reminded that the best rewards of being a parent are the surprises made possible by love. Bradley was our first child. And as the first son, you have a lot of big plans for him. We didn't know until he was a year and a half old that he had Down syndrome. And when we got that diagnosis, you mourn the death of your dreams and the goals that you had for him. And then, after you get up from your bed of self-pity, you set new goals, you have new dreams, you point in new directions, and then you go with it. 
We're so thankful Heavenly Father for this day and for the blessing. Around 5.30 p.m. on July 12th, 1993, while Twyla was out at a meeting, Jerry and their two sons, 21-year-old Bradley and 13-year-old Jonathan, were having dinner. She was cooking. You want the biggest pork chop, Dad? I want the biggest pork chop you got. Okay. We were talking about what we're going to do tomorrow. Dad was, you know, just talking to us, you know, regular dinner, dinner table conversation. Maybe Jonathan will get a phone call from his girlfriend oh, so he can yeah. listen in. Oh, yes. <laughs> Lay off, all right? Don't make me Growing up with Bradley, it's a lot different, but I wouldn't trade him in. He's too much fun. Like potatoes anyway. Yes, yeah, no, you favorite. don't. They're not your favorite. And you too. And you too. That's right. Bradley always. His food is a big part of his life. He have homework. He's always hungry and he's always wanting people to watch his food. Like it's gonna get up and walk away. You make an F. He made an F. <laughs> he better not have made an F. How much did you? It wasn't an F. It was a 75. Oh, he had chocolate. Huh? Okay. He had no TV in my room. Watch it. Mm. What's going on at work, Dad? My father face. Um, hell. You okay, Dad? Hey, I'm fucked up. He cannot talk. I thought that was pretty peculiar. What happened? He got something stuck with his throat. I said it to him, stuck on. Take it easy. I'll take care of it. I ran upstairs to see if I could find my Boy Scout handbook to make sure he was doing the timing maneuver right. I took note of the table first, and something just rang in as, you know, not right. I squeezed him three times. One, two, three. I feel coming out. <coughs> Bradley informed me quite quickly. I saved him. Yes. I said, afraid my father get hurt. I said, my father a lot. What did you do? My dad. I love him so much. In my heart. Yes, is everything Y'all clear? I'm fine. Jerry was still not able to say too much. He was still real weak. Okay. All right. I'm fine. I realized how close I came to coming in finding him on the floor dead. His parents, I always expect to be the one taking care of the children. All Brady told me to do was just stay calm and turn around and that he would take care of it. I'm still amazed at how calm he was and how sure he was and there was no uh, I think I can or I may be able to work or anything like that. He was just, he had 100% he had confidence that he would take care of the situation. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love you. I love you too. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Bradley Ard was given a heroism award by the Boy Scouts of America for saving his father's life that day. I don't think most people who have a handicapped child think of them as being capable of doing something as life-changing as life-saving. But if they're given the opportunity and the training, they can do it. If we have some time Bob White is the assistant scoutmaster for Troop 409, a special unit for the mentally and physically challenged, where Bradley learned his first aid skills. This is a, a kit for making a bat house. You never know for sure which part of your training has taken a grip on any of your scouts. One of my favorite variations on Murphy's Law is that no matter how hard you try, every once in a while, something's going to go right. Bradley doesn't know some people expect less of him. He only knows what is expected. Every morning he gets up, shaves, showers, gets ready for work, and at work he has a job to do. He feels he does a good job, and he does. He knows he's capable. And all he wants is a chance. 
Brad and I are very close. He's been a blessing to me. <laughs> and he can do so much. <laughs> he never thinks about his handicap. So it don't go in the hole. He didn't tell me that he was handicapped when I asked him, hit me. Or he couldn't do it. All he told me was that he would take care of me. Oh, yes. He wants a pamphlet. I pray for my God to take care of my father, the greatest father, my dad. Yes.